Now, we, you might recall we left our last class, didn't we, with that, uh, with that wonderful, incredible thought that, that our Lord, who having just experienced the ultimate change from a body that was racked with weariness and with exhaustion and fatigue of mortality, on that very morning, as our Lord felt the warmth and the glow of divine spirit power, flow and radiate through his body completely, invigorating him, energising him, enlivening him forever from that moment on, forever to be in, empowered by divine spirit. And that moment, brothers and sisters, at one of the greatest moments in history for our Lord, we were left, weren't we, absolutely stunned that at this pinnacle moment in his life, when he had just been changed to immortality, on that very day, we find him still searching and supporting and seeking those whom he came to save. What a great shepherd. What a truly great shepherd he really is. And we mentioned, didn't we, last, at our last class, that there were a thousand things that our Lord could have done on that day. There were a thousand angels he could have conversed with. There are a thousand places he might have wanted to go to. But we find our Lord on that very day walking down the dusty track of humanity. And for two to three hours, brothers and sisters, that journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus, our Lord was there to convince and to convict and to assure this doubting, and this disillusioned and disappointed couple in our story to keep on trusting. Now, there was another journey, which Luke also records, another journey of a man, you might remember this one as well, another man walking down a long, dusty road. And this man too, he was walking away from Jerusalem. Actually, he was striding away from Jerusalem. Not disappointed like our couple is in the story we're looking at because they left Jerusalem, had they? Because their faith and their belief was absolutely rocked. But this man, no, no, this man here, the journey that he was making, he was a Pharisee and he wasn't disappointed at all. No doubts whatever in his mind. There weren't tears and sadness from this man at all. It was breathing out threatenings and slaughter. And as Saul walked from Jerusalem all the way to Damascus, our Lord appeared to this man as well. And our Lord appeared again, searching and seeking and supporting and desperate to save lives. And even this man in, our, in, in this story here, even this man who was at boiling point, he was simmering, he was, he was stewing over his emotions, holding letters of authority to do whatever he could to the Christians, our Lord intervened in his journey. And like our couple, this man didn't know who it was at first that spoke to him. But he listened. And his eyes too were holding. And it was three days since all those things happened before the scales actually fell from his eyes. And as we got there on the screen, he arose in Acts 9 verse 18, just like our couple does in Luke 24 verse 33. He arose and that man commenced another journey in his life and he became one of the greatest followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Such was the man, the Apostle Paul. And brothers and sisters and young people, 2,000 years later, our Lord still hasn't stopped seeking and searching and supporting, desperate to save, even in all of our lives today. You know, we may feel at times doubting and disillusioned and disappointed in, in our own personal journey, in what life may sadly have dished out for us, like the couple in Luke chapter 24. Or we might feel angry and annoyed and aggravated by others like Saul was, Saul of Tarsus. But one day, our eyes too will be open. It will be revealed to us all. Those moments, those, those personal moments in each of our lives where the Lord was right there alongside of us. And those moments we, we may not have seen might have occurred today. We may not have seen, our eyes might have been holding, we may not have recognised or identified the Lord's influence in our lives, but he was and he is and he will be totally engaged in the salvation of each one of us. But we must remove the buts 
We must remove the disappointments. We must remove the anger and to keep on trusting. So back to our story, Luke chapter 24. And as we ended our class last time, I said, I think there's another reason why the Lord singled out this couple. And I think there's another reason why the Lord appears to Cleophas and Mary before he appeared to his disciples. You know, that's an amazing thing in itself. That the, that the Lord will appear to this couple before appearing to the 11 disciples. He, he would spend time walking down the dusty road before he appears to his disciples. You know, before the Lord would again look with love and understanding deep into the eyes of Peter, just as he had done three days earlier when the Lord looked and turned and looked at Peter, before the Lord again is going to look at him, he's going to walk with this couple. Before the Lord, brothers and sisters, is going to put his arm around the disciple whom he loved, John, before that moment, he's going to walk with this couple. Before he connected with every one of his special friends, his disciples, his mother and others that Luke 24 verse 33 tells us were locked behind doors at that very moment. Before he appeared to all them, he would spend two to three hours engaging in this riveting conversation with this couple. So why? Why did the Lord feel that it was a first, his first priority was to appear to Cleophas and Mary first before all the others. Well, to answer this, we've got to go back and we've got to consider very, very briefly some of the events that did occur three days before this moment. We've got to look at some of the information that's possibly there for us regarding Cleophas and Mary and, and try to put a few things in order and how the events actually did occur from the, res from the crucifixion and onwards. And, and look, it actually is quite difficult to reconcile all the events, the four gospel accounts, in the exact order of how things might have flown. Because Mark well, Matthew writes some things that Mark leaves out. And the other things that Luke records, John may have admitted altogether. So it is difficult to actually chronologically put exactly what they happen, how they happen. And I really want to thank, um, and I know Brother Fred's not here tonight, I know he's, he's not well, he, he was meant to be the chairman, but uh, he's not well. But I want to thank Brother Fred, because he's, he's put a lot of effort and he's helped me out immensely. He's, he's put together a couple of little timelines which, um, which I've been able to use, and if anyone wants to have a look at these, it's brilliant. Um, but Fr Fred's done an awesome work to help me out with that, so it's really, really good. So here we go. Let's go back three days before these events occur and we're going to pick up our story. I'm going to put it on the screen here. We're going to pick up our story from John chapter 19 verse 25. Now there stood by the cross. You know that is so easy to read. Stood by the cross. We're going to look at that statement and what it really, really means in a minute. There stood by the cross. Now look who's there right alongside the cross. This is three days earlier. The cross of Jesus. Number one, his mother. Number two, his mother's sister. Does anyone know the name of his mother's sister? Salome. Salome. Well done. So I've just listed it there for those who didn't see that. Uh, so there's his mother. There's Salome, who is his mother's sister. There's Mary, the wife of Cleophas, who I'm going to tell you right now is I think that this is Mary's sister-in-law. I think it's Mary's sister-in-law. We'll come back to that in a minute. So we've got Mary, we've got Salome, we've got Mary the wife of Cleopas, and we've got Mary Magdalene. We've got these four women, four women, and of course there are others who make up the core group, the core group in those women who ministered unto the Lord in his, during his ministry. Now, if we were to look also at how Mark describes this. You notice here in Mark chapter 15, he says that standing by the cross, there's Mary, the mother of James the Less and of Joses, who I'm going to submit to you and we're going to show you tonight, though I think this is still this Mary, the wife of Cleopas, but Mark refers to her as Mary, the mother of James the Less and of Joses. He also refers to here as Mary, the mother of Joses. And in verse 1 of chapter 16, he refers to her as Mary, the mother of James. 
All the same Mary, the wife of... Here we are again. So that was John's, that was Mark's. Now if you wanted to have a look and see what, um, how Matthew records this event, we're going to look at it like this. Matthew here records, he says it's Mary the mother of James and Josie, so he says it the same as Mark. He also now changes it to Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. And then in verse 1 of chapter 28, it says there, on the Sabbath, as it began to dawn, comes Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. So I'm submitting to you that this Mary here is the same Mary, the wife of Cleophas. So she's the mother of James, according to Mark and Matthew's account. So why did I say that Mary, is, who is the wife of Cleophas, is the sister-in-law to the mother of Jesus, to Mary, the mother of Jesus? Well, there are quite a, a, a lot, quite a lot of reliable historians who all agree that Cleophas was most likely and could well have been the brother of Joseph, the husband of Mary which would make Cleophas the uncle of Jesus. And as I said, there are a lot of historians who confirm this. And there's a lot of sense that this could well be the case. And it, it may explain why Mary, the wife of Cleopas, is so supportive, so caring, and so helpful to Mary, the mother of the Lord. Because if Joseph had died years earlier, that would explain why Mary, the wife of Cleophas, if she was the sister-in-law to the mother of the Lord, of Mary, why she was so caring, so supportive, and showed so much concern for Mary, because Joseph possibly may have died. Now, to add another twist to this, Cleophas is the same name as Alpheus. Same name, but expressed in a different dialect. So the Hebrew scholars tell us. So both Cleophas and Alphaeus could well be the same person in the gospel. And we know that James, the son of Alphaeus, James, the son of Alphaeus, or Matthew, the son of Alphaeus, could all be the sons of Mary, the wife of Cleophas or Alphaeus. So, whether Cleophas is Alpheus, it's not critical, but it's certainly very interesting, and one day we'll definitely know. So, back to our quote in John chapter 19. Just think about this for a minute. Mary. The Mary in our story, John writes, that she, along with some of the other women, she stood by the cross, right alongside of the cross. And I want you to spare a bit of time and think about, just for the minute, what that entailed. What did Mary see on that day? That very long, tiring, exhausting day. The day that Jesus was crucified. So we know from this verse here in John that she definitely was at the cross 9 o'clock in the morning when the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. But no doubt her day started a lot earlier than that. She probably hadn't slept the previous evening. No doubt she would have heard the news late into the evening, on the previous evening, that the Lord had been arrested. So Mary was, was probably quite up very early that next day, probably five or six o'clock in the morning. And perhaps she was standing there in the crowd, brothers and sisters, outside of Pilate's palace. And she would have gasped when she saw the Lord stumble out onto the judgment hall out onto that area which is called the pavement, where Pilate says, Behold the man! And her first view of the Lord that morning, as he staggers out under the effects of the whipping and of the scourging, would have been a horrific picture to behold. And she probably couldn't believe her ears, brothers and sisters, when everyone all around her, the crowd all around her, started turning on the Lord Jesus Christ. And she stood there as there were shouts of, crucify him, crucify him. And it was probably too much for Mary to bear. And she would have watched and followed as he was roughly taken towards Golgotha. 
And Mary would have saw the Lord stagger under the weight of the cross as the Lord was dragging it behind him until he could go no further. And he falls to the ground and the Roman soldiers grab some man from the crowd, Simon Cyrene, and grab him. What a moment that changed his life. Grabbed him from the crowd and, and he there had to help bear the cross. And Mary would have saw the Lord as he was treated near the near. Near exhaustion, brothers and sisters, as he is brutally handled by the soldiers. And she would have seen as he was nailed to the cross. And she would have heard every hollow thump of the hammer as it echoed round and round and round. And she heard the Lord, brothers and sisters, enduring intense pain. And she would have heard him clearly say those words, Father, forgive them. And she would have seen the Lord utter those words as he was looking up into the eyes of a Roman soldier. Father, forgive them. As his hands and feet were nailed to that cross. And she was there. She stayed right there next to the cross from nine o'clock right through to 12 noon. And she would have heard, brothers and sisters, the Lord utter the words from the cross. She saw firsthand the pain. She watched the rulers deride him. She saw the soldiers mock him and others railed upon him. And she watched at noon when the sun was at its height, at the hottest part of the day, and she saw the clouds gathering eerily. And the sun was darkened and the heavens grew black and dark. And she stood there for another three hours from noon right through to 3 p.m. And during that time, she watched as the Lord struggled with his breathing. And she heard him take shallow breaths. She stood by the cross. And she heard the longer and longer moments between each breath until that moment when the Lord, with his last effort, heaved his body up on that cross. And Luke 23, verse 46 says, He says with a loud voice, Into thy hands I commit my spirit. And Mary stood there and witnessed our Lord give up his spirit. And she felt the earthquake as she saw the rocks rend and she felt the thunder and the lightning as the emotions of God were expressed at what had happened. And she still stood by the cross. And then sometime between three o'clock in the afternoon and six o'clock that evening, she saw a couple of Roman soldiers come, each with a, a lump of wood. And as they stood glaring up at those thieves on either side, Mary would have heard as, as they got that lump of wood and as they belted the thieves' legs and bashed and broke the bones. And no doubt she held her breath as she watched one Roman soldier stood in front of the Lord as he paused and he looked up at, it, at, at the Lord and she watched as he spear pierced through into the side of the Lord. No doubt the tears were flowing down Mary's cheeks and she stood there still by the cross. She didn't leave. And then she saw in the distance two men who were approaching and she watched them as they were both coming closer and she saw and noticed that one was holding some linen and others were holding some, some spices. And she watches as is Luke chapter 23 and verse 55 says, the women which came from Galilee followed after him and beheld the sepulchre and how his body lay. Mark says that she beheld where they lay his body. Where they lay his body. That's what Mark says. You can't see it behind there, but that's what Mark says and Matthew. So what a long day that had already been for Mary and for all that band of faithful women. Committed right up to what they thought was the end. They trusted, as we saw in our last class in verse 21, they trusted that it would have been him, but, but was the feeling of all the women and all the disciples, but now after what they had seen on that day. Yet as women do, 
as women so often do, this little group, this little group of faithful women would commit right to the end. So Luke informs us in verse 56 that they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to to the commandment. Luke tells us they beheld where his body was laid and they returned and prepared spices. Now it is very, very difficult, brothers and sisters, to perhaps get our heads around and, and here's a little bit of a chart which might help us. I'm more than happy to share that with you if you'd like one. But I've got on this little chart here where we can see the Last Supper, Jesus' arrest, he was crucified here, he died here at 3 pm, and then just before 6 pm he was buried. The next day was a high day. So this Thursday is what we call a high day. It was the 15th day of Abib, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And Luke, and Leviticus 23 verse 7 says, you were to do no servile, no regular work on that day. So the women rested on this day here. Which leaves us then on the Friday... On the Friday, that was where they could go out and organise the spices. As verse 56 says, they rested. And then the next day, which was the Sabbath, they would then rest on the, on the, on the Thursday, get the spices on the Friday. This was the weekly Sabbath where they rested. And then we come to our moment where on very, very early on the Sunday morning, they are now going to meet. And it was, it was planned for this faithful group to meet after the Sabbath, to honour and anoint the Lord's body as the final act of love and devotion to their Lord. And it's very, very difficult, as I said, to align the comings and goings of the women to the tomb. But we do know that it was very early. No one, no one could sleep. No one could have slept from the Wednesday through, right through to that Sunday. No one could sleep. And then early on the first day of the week, on the Sunday, these women were up, up very early, with a plan to meet at the tomb, possibly, say, 5 a.m. in the morning. While the rest of the household slept on, these, women, these faithful, committed women made their way, their separate ways, to the tomb. And here's where it tells us here that uh, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, brought spices that they might come anoint him. And very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. So here's Mary, brothers and sisters, on a new day, and she's about to face another long, tiring day. You know, if we thought the day when Jesus was crucified for Mary was a long day, this first day of the week is just as tiring for Mary, if not longer for her. Because we're going to find on this day, brothers and sisters and young people, Mary is on her feet for most of the third day. I'm sure many sisters can relate to this. Long, tiring days where they hardly have a moment to sit down. But just think about what happened on this third day. We're going to, we'll come back to these moment, this moment in a minute. But just let me explain what actually happened on this third day for Mary. She's up at the tomb very early in the morning, perhaps five o'clock. Hadn't slept for the last three days because of what had happened. The nightmares, the images, the horrific pictures. She couldn't erase them out of her head, brothers and sisters. The words, the sounds... As she stood alongside the cross and she hadn't slept a wink and here she is very early at the tomb. And as the day continues, what then did occur was perhaps, perhaps after all the comings and goings to the tomb, perhaps Cleophas says to Mary, it's too much. And it was his decision to return home. Perhaps Cleophas said in the, in the middle of the day on that third day, he said, look, it's too dangerous to stay here in Jerusalem. He felt it's a lost cause. Mary, come on, we've got to go home. We've got to go back to Emmaus. And perhaps Mary obediently, perhaps reluctantly followed him, leaving Jerusalem behind her. So here she is. She's up very, very early. Now she's walking for another 11 kilometres back to Emmaus with her husband. And then we find in our story that Mary... In verse 33 of Luke chapter 24, late in the evening after walking for 11 kilometres, there's a renewed spring in her step because of the discussions on the way with that stranger had stirred the hearts within them both, igniting them to burning point. And after such a long day, brothers and sisters, they just arrive home, the time when most people don't want visitors for tea, don't want visitors to stay the night. And after such a long, emotional, tiring day that she'd experienced... She constrains this stranger to stay the night. 
She then prepares a meal and finally Mary sits down. The first time perhaps that day she was off her feet and at that moment this unknown guest took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And their eyes were opened and they knew that it was the Lord. And it was the Lord, brothers and sisters, and he was there one minute, he was vanished the next. He was there one moment, then he was gone. And this couple, without even starting the meal, they're back on their feet and they're running all the way back to Jerusalem. What a tiring day that would have been, which now is going to go long into the night as she is now to meet with Cleophas, with all those that are in the upper room. What a long day. This day is for Mary. But I still haven't told you, have I, why does the Lord appear first to Cleophas and Mary before all the other disciples? But we will. So, verse 1. Luke now brings up the story of what actually occurred. Verse 1. It says there, now. What, what, a, what a word to start this final chapter off. Verse 1. Now. It's as if Luke, in chapter 24, he's got this moment now, he's got to his final chapter, which he's writing to Theophilus, and this is the moment, now, he says, this is the moment of change, the moment of revelation, the moment when everything is going to be revealed, and, and Luke can't wait to use this little word, and it's the last time he uses this little word, now. He'd used it many times in his Gospel account. Luke chapter 1 verse 7. Zacharias and Elizabeth were both now well stricken in years. The shepherds in Luke chapter 2 verse 15 were looking at each other and said, we've got to go to Bethlehem now. Simon, who held the baby, the little baby, Lord Jesus in his arms, said, Lord, now let thy servant depart in peace. And Luke goes all through his gospel with, with using this word to punch out major moments in individual lives. There was the one, the one just before this in, in Luke chapter 23 when the centurion says, Now, as he looked at all that was done, now, Luke chapter 23 verse 47, when the centurion saw what was done, certainly this was the Son of God. So Luke 24 verse 1 is the last now that Luke is to use. And the, intent, the tension and the excitement and the momentum is now about to gather. And he says, Now... Upon the first day of the week. This is the first time in the New Testament where we're alerted to this first day of the week principle, which is going to come as a memorial for our Lord from this moment on. On the first day of the week. Now, if we think back to Genesis chapter 1, on the first day, let there be light. And the spiritual light, brothers and sisters, the spiritual light that would shine forth from this story and illuminate the lives of this couple from this moment on is a miraculous event that is about to occur. So it says there in verse 1, very early in the morning. You may want to underline that in verse 1 there. Just put a note there that John 20 says, when it was yet dark, so it's possibly 5 a.m. in the morning. And look what it says in verse 1. They bring the spices which they had prepared. Now, I want you to think about this. What amazing women they are. Even though that they were heartbroken, they would have been going through this in a state of numbness at what had occurred, the blur of the last three days, the anguish, the inconsolable emotions, still raw, Feeling totally crushed and shattered, they don't just sit down, do they? But they do what women do best. And they prepared what they could do. They prepared spices. Do you know, brothers and sisters and young people, they actually saw three days earlier, Joseph and Nicodemus, in John chapter 19, carrying a load of linen and spices to anoint the body of our Lord. So they saw the two men already wrapping the body of our Lord and putting myrrh and alloys and spices during the wrapping of that linen cloth around the body. They'd already seen that had done. Does anyone know how much spices and myrrh and alloys that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea actually took with them? 32.7 kilograms. Oh. That's amazing. <laughs> You've left out, you've got just the two, the myrrh and the alloys. You've got to get the spices as well. It's a bit heavier. 
too much. But it's a hundred pounds. Very good, Ross. Very good. They took, according to John, 100 pounds, which is roughly, and I may have got it wrong, but I've got about 45 kilograms. So these women who are preparing spices saw three days earlier Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus taking 45 45 kilograms of spices already. Now, just to put that in, in perspective so we all know, a kilogram of flour is normally about that size in the, sh- in, in the Woolworths, and that would be about that size, pack it about that size. 45 of those, the women had saw, Joseph and Nicodemus, had already done that to the Lord. Wasn't that enough? I know, brothers, those of us who are sitting here, I know we would have looked at what Joseph and Nicodemus had done and thought, that's plenty, there's no need to do any more. We would have felt that as brethren, but not for these loyal, devoted, faithful, committed women. And there's a lesson right there, brothers and sisters and young people, that they could have not bothered. They could have felt that it was already done, no need to go overboard. We did watch and we saw as it had already been performed by Joseph and Nicodemus. But they didn't. They prepared and brought more. Have you ever felt that you could never do enough? Well, these women went above and beyond in the service of their Lord. Have you ever watched somebody doing something in in the ecclesia and felt, well, that's done, there's there's no need to do more? Not not these women. Verse 1 says, They hurriedly made their way to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And it suddenly dawned on these women... Who's going to roll away the stone from the door? And as they're rushing there through the streets of Jerusalem, perhaps talking in hushed tones, all of a sudden they felt the earth move beneath them, violently shaking again. And Matthew 28 verse 2 implies that prior to the women arriving at the tomb, another earthquake occurred where one angel, and we talked about this in our last class, just one angel came down and rolled away that stone and sat upon it. And we know what happened, don't we? Because the picture of this immortal being, when the tough Roman soldiers, those battle-hardened warriors, those men who were guarding the tomb, the one angel caused their knees to give way and they melted like water and the record describes them fainting with fear and did shake and became as dead men. Such was the powerful presence of one angel from heaven. Now, I do, I do note that Matthew does describe him flashing like lightning and his, right, his raiment was as white as snow. And these battle-hardened soldiers, when they came to, they, they bolted like rabbits into the city to make their report. And perhaps they passed the group of the women who at that precise moment were also making their way to the tomb. Not even an earthquake would stop these women, these courageous women. They had a mission to accomplish. Nothing would stop them from performing what they could do for the Lord. What amazing women. And particularly, of course, the one we're focusing on, Mary, the wife of Cleopas in our story. So verse 2 in in Luke chapter 24 is is they get closer. And look what it says in verse 2. They found the stone was rolled away. Perhaps that was the result, brothers and sisters, of the earthquake. And their first thoughts would have been, well, how fortunate is that? The stone has been removed by the earthquake. But their relief was about to be turned to grief because verse 3 says, they entered in and found not. You may want to just highlight, brothers and sisters, as we've got there on the screen, they found the stone gone But they found not the body. And interestingly, this little word found is repeated five times in in Luke chapter 24 then. You may want to highlight that. Imagine their first thoughts, brothers and sisters. The stones moved, relief, but short-lived because the Lord's body is gone. What grief that would have caused. What further seesaw of emotions for this group of women, these these poor women, the seesaw of emotions that have been up and down over the last three days. Little wonder it says in in verse 4. Let's read this together. Verse 4. 
And it came to pass as they were much perplexed. Let's pause there for a minute. That little word perplexed means to be at a complete loss or without a way or to know not what to do. Does anyone else know of the word perplex or perhaps an echo perplexity? Might have just possibly Luke might have used a chapter or two earlier. There shall be signs in the sun, moon and stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. No way out, as we know that word is in Luke 21. Similar word here is used in, by Luke again in verse 4 there. They were much perplexed. So these women, brothers and sisters and young people, suddenly were, were left with a sick feeling in their stomachs. Such an empty, confused, bewildered feeling. They knew not what to do. And especially as they looked at each other, the body was gone. Imagine that. Imagine that. As a sick feeling filled their stomachs. Who would do such a thing and take the body? And for one in that group, Mary Magdalene, this was all just too much. Her nerves and the tension that she was already experiencing was at breaking point. The events that she had witnessed of her Lord three days earlier was much too much to bear. She loved her Lord so much for all that he had done for her. And previously her life was total chaos, as we know. He cured seven devils out of her. Before meeting the Lord, her mind was, was dis disorientated, in turmoil, disordered. And it was all thinking it was mayhem. And our Lord provided a miracle in her life. And her confused, agitated, turbulent mind was cured, controlled and balanced. She was in her right mind. But now she felt it slipping back to how she was before. With all these feelings again and all confused and turmoil. It was all too much. And she runs out of the garden in a state of tears and shock. She runs out into the darkness. If only, brothers and sisters, if only Mary had stayed just a little bit longer at the tomb, she would have seen what the women saw as we continue verse 4. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. She would have seen those two angels. She would have heard their incredible comforting and, and their assuring words that, they can't, that the angels calmly said to the woman, these words, brothers and sisters, that we're going to see in a minute, instilled a little flicker of hope, a little belief that the Lord could be alive. We're going to come back to Mary Magdalene in a second, but I just want to follow Luke's account of what happened when Mary's now, she's left the group and she's running back to the disciples. But in verse 4, you, you know we read, didn't we, that these women, including Mary, the wife of Cleophas, found no body and they were much perplexed. Why? Well, it's only Luke, the doctor, in his gospel account that informs us that they found not the body. But they were much perplexed. Matthew doesn't record the missing body. Mark doesn't mention it. They just record the angels appearing to the women. But Luke records the body that was missing that caused the women to be much perplexed. What was it that caused the women to be so complexed? Well, yes, the body was missing, but there was more. You see, these women had seen Joseph and Nicodemus place the Lord's body in the tomb, and they saw as they wrapped the linen cloths around the body of the Lord. But they were much perplexed, brothers and sisters, because they found not the body, but they saw the linen Clothes lying. You'll notice it's also repeated there in verse 12, where Peter, in Luke 24, verse 12, he also beheld the linen clothes lying. You see, brothers and sisters, there was something about the linen clothes which the women saw instantly and noticed and caused them to be much perplexed. You see, John uses an interesting word when he describes this event with linen clothes. 
It wasn't that there wasn't just a body, but it was the linen clothes. And John mentions in John 20, he mentions three times in three verses, the linen clothes, the linen clothes, the linen clothes. And he uses a very interesting Greek word when he says they were wrapped together. Let's just read this, brothers and sisters and young people. There's where John uses it in his account. Now look at this. It wasn't just that there was no body, but it was the linen clothes and a very interesting Greek word is used to describe how they were wrapped together. One commentator mentions the meaning of the use of the Greek in this verse, and he says this, there is a strong hint that the clothes were not folded as if Jesus had unwound them and then deposited them in two neat piles on the shelf. The word used to describe the napkin or headcloth does not suggest a flat folded square like table neck, but a ball of cloth bearing the appearance of being rolled around an object that was no longer there. The linen wrappings were in a position where the body had lain and the headcloth was where the head had been. The shape of the body was still apparent in them. It was wound around as if the body was still there, but there was no body. Much perplexed. You see, the women saw the linen clothing as if in a shape that it was still wrapped around a body. And it's impossible to take a body out without unwrapping the linen clothes. You know for a fact that it's impossible. The incident of Lazarus, he came out bound hand and foot, bound hand and foot. Loose him, said Jesus, and let him go. But here in the Lord's tomb, brothers and sisters, the linen cloths were still wrapped around as if in the shape of a body, but there was no body. No wonder. These women were much Perplexed. But before they can even utter a word, look what it says in verse 4. It came to pass as they were much complexed, perplexed, there stood about them two men, two angels. And I love this little phrase. See that in verse 4? Two men stood by them. You see, these women had previously stood by the cross. And now these two angels stood by them in, in shining garments. And that word shining means to, to flash like lightning. Dazzling raiment, says Rotherham. And the women, no doubt, fall to the ground in reverence, in absolute awe in seeing and listening to what the angel says. And look what the angel says. This statement would have, would have sent a shiver of excitement down their spine. Look what he says in verse 5. Why seek ye the living among the dead? What a statement that is, brothers and sisters. You may want to put a little note in your margin. This is the literal Greek of that statement. Why seek the living among the dead. The literal Greek means, why do you seek the living one? The living one among the dead. You know, that title, the living one, is just another title we can add to the titles of our Lord Jesus Christ. The true light, the Lamb of God, the Messiah, the Deliverer, the seed, the just, now the living one. And the angels go on to say in verse 6, he is not here, but, <laughs> you want to circle that little word, but, and put a little contrast to what we discovered in our last class in verse 21, but, says the angel, three words, he is risen. And three words is all it needed for these women to be absolutely convinced and believe what these angels had said. Remember, says the angels in verse 6, remember how he spake unto you. And verse 8 says, they remembered. They remembered. Belief and now remembrance. What a wonderful confirmation of the faith of these women. Not only, brothers and sisters, did they minister to the Lord during his ministry, but they actually listened, as women do. And it all came back now as they remembered. And in a short time, brothers and sisters, in a short time later, because of their devotion to the Lord and because of their belief in those three words, he is risen, these women, these women would experience an eye-opening, life-changing moment before the disciples would. Because the Lord himself would actually appear to these women before he revealed himself to the disciples. But I don't think at that moment when the Lord appeared 
to the group of women. We're going to see that in a minute. I don't think they were still all together. You see, I think as we see our story unfold, we're going to see these women as they run back to the disciples and perhaps they got separated as they went when they went to tell the disciples that, that, that they'd seen an angel and perhaps as they were on their way, Jesus, it says, he appears to them and I think Mary was missing. We certainly know Mary Magdalene wasn't there and I feel that Mary, the wife of Cleophas, wasn't there either. And that's why the Lord appears in our story specifically to Mary on the way to Emmaus before appearing to the disciples to make up that little group of women the Lord appeared to all of them first. Mary was a part of that special group who stood by the cross. And she may not necessarily have been there when the Lord first appeared to the women as we'll show you. But she certainly did see the Lord appear as the Lord sought out Mary on the way to Emmaus because she was the last of that group of women who he would appear to before the disciples. So Matthew chapter 28 says that the women, they departed quickly from the sepulchre with great joy, fear and great joy, and they, and they ran to the disciples to take word. And things appear very quickly and things happen very quickly from this moment on because Jesus is going to appear to those women. He's also going to appear also first to Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was the first one we said that left the scene of the tomb that morning. She saw the stone move. She couldn't hold back and she disappeared into the shadows and she rushed off to John and Peter and the disciples in uncontrollable distress. And she leaves the other women there at the tomb who see the angels and Mary as we know she would have rushed back to the disciples and she blurted out the disciples how the stone was moved and they've taken the Lord and I don't know what they've done with him and Mary's confusion and emotion was was too much as as she tells that to to the disciples and and hearing that Peter and John they run back to the tomb John as we know outruns Peter and they run to the tomb through the streets to check out if what Mary had said was true. Was the body there or not? And as they arrive at the tomb, John and Peter, the group of women, had just left moments earlier. And here's an interesting thing. The angels appeared to the women, but they didn't appear to Peter or John. Another interesting thing about what the women saw first. So you can imagine Peter and John, breathless, as they, as they make their run. And John, as we know, rushes to the tomb and he gets there just before Peter. And it's interesting, as we've already seen the linen cloths, that John uses three different words to describe how both of them saw the situation. It says there that John goes in first and he saw the linen clothes. That means he looked in. He was aware, he noticed, he observed at a glance that he confirmed that the body wasn't there. But he looked at the clothes. So that word there means to be, a, 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 to be aware of it, to observe and to notice. Peter then rushes in, goes right in, and he sees, and that word is the Greek word thero, from which we get the word theory. He's looking carefully and he views attentively, studiously at what he saw in the tomb. He saw the linen clothes, says Peter. And then finally, John goes also into the tomb after Peter had walked in. And it says there, John saw and believed, not just literally to see as he looked at those linen cloths, but he perceived with understanding and a discerning mind. He knew, he believed. He wasn't brothers and sisters it wasn't that the body was gone it was that they saw the linen cloths and I wondered at that moment where John and Peter are in the tomb I wonder if John turns to Peter I wonder if John turns to Peter and he puts his arms around his fisherman friend John would have known that Peter was suffering emotionally greatly over the last three days John had heard Peter say those three denials to the Lord and he knew John knew that his friend was was very emotionally upset. In fact, it says, just turn back to Luke chapter 22, verse 62. This is Peter's reaction on the night after he denied his Lord. Look at what it says in Luke 22, verse 62. Peter went out and wept. And then it adds that little word, bitterly. Because on that night, John saw Peter as, as the tears ran down his cheek. Bitter tears, tears of acid that left marks down Peter's face. So I wonder if in the tomb John whispers to Peter, 
He's alive. But neither of the disciples at this moment either saw the angels or either saw their resurrected Lord and they left. And Peter is going to come back in, John, in Luke chapter 24 in verse 12. He's going to come back a little bit later on that day. Later in the afternoon, it tells that Peter actually comes back alone and he beheld the linen cloths again. And it says, he wondered in himself. He was absolutely amazed, astonished is what that word wondered meant. And for Peter too, he was going to experience something very, very special later that afternoon. Because when the Lord leaves Cleophas and Mary at the meal table, our Lord returns to Jerusalem and he appears to Peter just after this moment. But that's another story. So Peter and John left the tomb wondering and, and bewildered at what had happened just at the precise moment as Mary Magdalene again returns to the tomb. And by now, all the other women had gone, and Peter and John had gone as well, and Mary felt so alone at that moment. She had lost her Lord, the one who had restored her confidence, the one who had provided her life again. He was dead, and worse, she didn't know where they had taken him. And with tears filled with emotion, uncontrollably emotionally upset, she looked into the sepulchre, it says in John's Gospel, and she sees two men, two angels, who weren't visible to Peter and John just moments earlier. And Mary, as we know, she doesn't recognise them as angels. She's too emotionally upset and shocked. But at that moment, she hears a voice behind her, outside in the garden. And the words, the calm words, the confident words, the composed words, Woman, why weepest thou? And Mary, she, 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 she blurts out to this figure who, who, who she thought was just the gardener and she turns and looks at him and she says, because they've taken away my Lord and I know not where they have laid him. And she says, sir, if you have borne him hence, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Mary, Mary is going to carry the Lord's body away. What love and devotion had this grief-stricken woman Mary says to the gardener, who she thought was a gardener, that, that she'll pick up the Lord in her arms and, and carry this lifeless body and, and take him away. What love this woman really had. But as she just said that, the next word changes her world. Mary. Mary, says the Lord. And she spun around and, and she says, as we know in John chapter 20, she says, Rabboni, and she rushes to the Lord and she wraps her arms around the Lord, determined never to let him go. Brothers and sisters, how would you react on that day when you hear your name called? When you hear your name called, brothers and sisters, and, and you're there and, and your name's called, David's called. And the name is called and you go before the Lord Jesus Christ. What a moment each one of us is going to experience what Mary experiences right now. But, but the Lord says to Mary, she says, Mary, Mary, don't cling to me. Go back to your disciples and tell them that I am risen. And with that, the Lord's gone. But Mary, brothers and sisters, her heart was beating a million times a minute and her emotions were changed to absolute joy. And she now turns and she sprints back to the disciples with news that she had seen the Lord. And it was then, brothers and sisters, as she's heading off that way, that the Lord appears also to the women as well. And we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. But as they all now converge back to the disciples in the upper room, verse 11 tells us this interesting reaction of the disciples. The women all rush in and say, we've, we've, we've seen the angels at the tomb. And verse 11 in Luke chapter 24 says, their words seem to them as idle tales. You may want to put a little note in your margin, brothers and sisters. The word idle means twaddle, silly talk, nonsense. It's the word where we get the Greek word delirious. The disciples thought that the women were absolutely off their head, delirious. And they believed them not. It's not so much that they didn't believe, brothers and sisters, but they disbelieved what the women had said. You know, it's interesting, when you look at uh, Mark's, Mark's account, very, very quickly, 
the positive message of the angels. He's risen. You'll see him. He's risen. He appeared. He was alive. But they believed not. And the Lord, when he does appear to the men, he upbraided them because of their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not those that had seen him risen. Very, very quickly, brothers and sisters, I can see our time's run out. <clears throat> but I just want to show you here that here is the, the 12 recorded, um, the 12 accounts where the Lord actually does appear after his resurrection. So he appears first to Mary Magdalene. He appears then to the women that follow Jesus, but not all of them. He then appears to the last one in that group of women on the way to Emmaus. He then appears to Peter that same afternoon before all the eleven. And then he appears in the upper room to the eleven, eight days later, up at the Galilee, on the mount, 500 brethren to James, Acts chapter 1 as he ascends, and of course the Apostle Paul as he heads off um, on, the way to Dema on the way to Damascus. Well, brothers and sisters, we have certainly run out of time. So what we're going to finish here is we're going to finish here on that note there. In our next study, God willing, we're going to open up the account and we're going to actually see now the conversation that's happening between Cleophas and Mary as they make their way back to Amaze.